I'm frankly not that interested in talking about store windows or merchandise being taken off of store shelves as compared to the lives of people who are uh, not only you know being killed by police, but also lives of people that are just squeezed by the everyday system. And um, you know, the store windows, uh, the merchandise from shelves can be replaced, a life can't be replaced. And uh, I think that that's um, one thing that you will hear a lot from the young people who are, who are protesting. Um, it's not, you know, this movement is being led by black youth. This movement is not being led by Antifa. It's not actually being led by, it, it's not about Antifa. It's actually about oppressed people who are rising up. And um, that is one thing that's happening. A riot is the language of the oppressed. And uh, things, w things do change as a result of rioting. Things do change. I want to ask you about that. But first, you say store merchandise can be replaced. We know there are neighborhoods in places like Detroit and Washington <laughs> that took decades, if never, uh, to recover. Uh, after the riots of 1967 and 1968? You know, um, in the vast majority of cities, actually the um, windows that have been crushed, the merchandise that has been stolen has been from large corporations, has been from uh, actually luxury stores. And uh, I'm wondering why people aren't talking more about, you know, every everyone's talking about, you know, maybe black owned businesses. I, I empathize with that, but why isn't anyone talking about one of the only people who's been killed in the, these protests is uh, a man in Louisville, Kentucky, who was standing near his business, a barbecue business in Louisville, Kentucky. He used to serve free meals to the police and he got shot while standing near his business by the police. Uh, I just, um I, I think that this is, unfair to be focusing on the looting when actually what we should be focusing on is what caused these uprisings to begin with. Gary the Free. Well, I guess I was going to, I guess I would push back a little bit uh, with what Lacey just said. You know, I live actually, the area I live in was very much affected by the, the riots in 1968. And I do think it took a huge amount of time to, to get the community back in shape. And I do think a lot of the local residents paid a price for that. I imagine, you know, after you have a big event like this, getting anybody to invest in a community becomes much more difficult. And I think a problem you face in interpreting what's going on here <clears throat> is a problem I think both people on the left and the right face, which is on the right, people want to see that the problem here is, a, if you will, a, a kind of a tumor, right? That this, this protest movement, this violent protest needs to be, you know, we need to get those violent people out of there. But in a way, what you have is much more of a social movement. I mean, you could say it's comparing a tumor to the flu, where you've got a complicated set of responses that range from people that are, are very concerned about where the country's going and concerned about justice and are out peacefully protesting and are out trying to change the system for the better and want their children to have a, a better life than they did. But ranging all the way from people who are kind of free riders, basically, who do not share all those sentiments, who are committing criminal acts. I, I mean, it's just the way it is, that you get the whole spectrum uh, in a movement like this from people who are extremely uh, well-intentioned and motivated for all the best reasons, all the way to everyday criminals, basically. And unfortunately, that's the whole mix.